Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part 13 of Kerbal Spaceships, our serious business. And we have a geostationary orbit contract, which seems to be a logical next step, given our trouble communicating and with communication black spots, uh, and given that we actually have a launcher that probably has enough Delta V. Now obviously while we're at it we've got some other missions or contracts we can take for sounding rockets. Yes, I think we will send our geostationary satellite above the 4,000 kilometers we need. And similarly, my background in uh, astrodynamics tells me that geostationary orbit is above 100 kilometers, so we can get that second contract for free as well. And so our rocket is essentially the same as the one that we use to go to the moon. We have the same Soyuz first stage with some uh, solid rocket boosters to assist it in its first couple of minutes, well, first 30 seconds or so of launch. The second stage is the, uh, again, a Soyuz derived upper stage. Then we go to an AJ-10, the early model rather than the uh, starter version. And hopefully this will actually get us there. Now, it actually takes slightly more delta V to put a vehicle into geostationary orbit than it does to put it into a lunar orbit. Again, this is one of those little magic bits of uh, orbital mechanics mathematics that can be explained by invoking the mysticism of the Oberth effect. Basically, when we're being captured by the moon, we're doing it inside the, lunar's gra the moon's gravity well, close to the surface, where we means we are far we're, our velocity is higher. Therefore, Mr. Oberth says that we're getting more bang for our buck in terms of fuel. Regardless of this, it's not a huge difference, so we can more or less rely on this to be able to put ourselves into orbit. Now, the contract specifically says that I have to be within three degrees of the equatorial plane, which is why I am launching from Kourou, which is in French Guiana. Thanks for everyone that responded to that incidentally. Yeah, no, it's not in Ecuador. I don't know what I was thinking, although Ecuador does actually cross the equator. Ecuador does actually lay claim to having the highest mountain near the equator and therefore the point that is furthest from the center of the earth. There's a mountain called Chimborazo which is basically a volcano that hasn't erupted for centuries and you can stand on top of that and that will put you the furthest away from the center of the earth. The closest you can get to space while still being on the earth. You see, Everest is like you know, two and a half kilometers taller than Chimborazo, but because the the mean sea level at the equator is higher, you, you basically uh, Chimborazo ends up being about two kilometers further out from the center of the Earth. Anyway, as you can see, the launch went pretty much to schedule, leaving us with our final AJ-10 propelled stage. We're circularizing this uh, with this. It has, of course, three ignitions, which we're going to use. We're going to use one for initial orbital insertion. The second ignition will be to put ourselves into the geostationary transfer orbit. And the third will be for beginning the circularization, because uh, maybe we'll have some fuel left over. Now, Kourou is about five degrees north of the equator. So that means that when we go into like a straight up orbit, we're gonna have a five degree inclination. We need to get this down to three degrees, which is why I'm gonna wait to do my orbital insertion until we do it at either the ascending or descending node. Now, with the default flight engineer set up, I don't actually have any feedback as to what my, um, what my inclination is, but with a bit of tweaking, you can see that I now have time to equatorial ascending node and descending node and inclination of 5.17 degrees. So I don't actually see where it is, but what I'm gonna do is use the time to ascending node and then use the time to maneuver and try to make those match up. So my first opportunity is roughly there, but whether I think that may not be the best place for it, largely because I may not be able to get a signal there, right? It'll all depend upon... It might actually depend on another one of the satellites that I've previously launched acting as a relay. But I'm going to set up the maneuver and then we're going to figure out whether it is a good window for the, the maneuver, right? If it doesn't work, if it's not going to work, that's fine. We will just delay another half orbit and we'll keep on delaying it until we have a good 
signal for our transfer orbit. This will of course get a lot easier when I actually have geostationary, um, you know, satellites up there. Although, this is Kerbal Space Program, we don't really need geostationary satellites because the remote tech is going to handle all the antenna pointing for us. Geostationary satellites are mostly interesting for people that want satellite TV. Basically, if you want a fixed antenna because you are trying to sell satellite TV as cheaply as possible, which means you can't have expensive steerable dishes. You need a dish which will point at one position in the sky. Therefore, geostationary orbit is the way you can do that. Anyway, it turned out that my first opportunity was not good. My second opportunity, at first glance, seemed to be in a really bad position because it was in the middle of the Pacific. But we have another satellite that is relaying the signal from California. So it was decided, or I decided, that that was my best opportunity. So we line ourselves up, of course, using the RCS thrusters, and then we'll uh, begin our ascent into a higher orbit. Now... Um, the first attempts at launching geostationary satellites on Earth, or in, in real life, were the SINCOM satellites. They were built in the early 60s. Now, the first one, SINCOM-1, was supposed to launch and go into a 24-hour a orbit, but unfortunately they lost contact with it. The spacecraft seemed to shut down, it stopped responding as it was performing its final orbital insertion burn. And it wasn't until they actually pointed a telescope at where it was supposed to be that they found that it had, in fact, put itself into a correct orbit, or at least put itself into a 24-hour orbit. So, uh, SYNCOM-1, it successfully maneuvered, but it didn't actually become a communications satellite. It became a... well, I guess it's still up there, it's just a bit of space junk. SYNCOM-2 was the one that actually managed to get into orbit, but it technically wasn't a geostationary orbit because uh, they didn't bother to do inclination correction. Okay, so we have unstable propellant here, throttling. There we go, using the RCS, and now we are stable, and we are gone. Incidentally, I know that Remote Tech does offer a flight computer that lets you essentially arrange to fire the engines at a certain time, a certain maneuver mode. This, however, has a number of problems in real fuels and with engine igniter because you, of course, have to deal with... Uh, fuel instability and the computer that they offer does not do anything about that so typically what will happen is it'll get to the time and then your engine will fire and immediately go out and you'll waste all your ignitions and that'll be the end of your mission so yeah can't actually do that you have to do it manually at this time anyway i did it kind of manually and i overshot so what I start to do now is perform corrections using the, the RCS fuel on board. We want to make sure that we get the most use out of this, and we actually have a decent amount of RCS fuel for this stage. So I'm just going to fire my little RCS translation thrusters to get my apoaps to the correct altitude. I basically uh, overshot a little, and now I'm slowing myself down so that I can actually hit my targeted orbit. We're using this uh, fuel, obviously, because we have a very limited fuel budget in the final stage. You can see just over 1,400 meters per second. We have 84 meters per second in the remaining in the first stage, so any of this uh, fuel that we can use up, any of this RCS fuel or any Delta V we can get from RCS is going to be a bonus on this front. Anyway, that's looking good. Also note that during that maneuver, I managed to take my inclination down from five degrees now to a quarter of a degree. So we are within our degree tolerance, we're within three degrees. We just now need to get the altitude of this orbit set correctly. And there's very, very fine constraints on that. We need to get the period within a, a very tight window and we need to get the, um, we need to get the apoaps and the periaps in a pretty strict range here. Now, as I was saying, SYNCOM-2 was the first satellite to go into a 24-hour orbit and act as a communication satellite. However, it was an inclined orbit, so you needed to actively follow it with uh, antenna. It did apparently carry the first international telephone call via a satellite, and that was between the president of the US and the president of Nigeria, of all places. 
Not sure why, uh, what was so important, but yes, the, the Nigeria was the recipient of the first satellite telephone call. But anyway, the third SYNCOM satellite, that was the one that actually got a proper geostationary orbit. It put itself into an orbit where it was essentially zero degrees inclination and it had a period of 24 hours. And I wasn't sure where this thing was going to end up, so I'm actually really happy that this seems to be in a perfect place to provide transatlantic communications. Ah, that's, that's actually a that's complete fluke, to be honest. Anyway, we've got to get ourselves ready for this uh, maneuver to get it into orbit, so we're going to line the thing up along the maneuver vector. And we have two minutes to the node, so of course we're going to use our RCS thrust again, to first of all to get stabilized, to get the fuel stabilized, but we also want to use the RCS thrusters on this first stage, just to give us a little bit more uh, window, or whatever, a little bit of leeway on our Delta V, because if you look, the number is 1471, and we are really, really, really close to that in terms of, of our Delta V requirements. We are so close, we do not want to have to make corrections here. So any amount of any amount of help this RCS can give us will be very, very much appreciated. There we go. Getting ready. Just at letting the fuel settle to the bottom of the tank. You know, Ulage thrusters, they only need a very, very small acceleration. Just enough to make sure that everything that everything covers the fuel pipes at the bottom of the tank and the, the gas bubbles go to the top. Okay, we're getting close to firing the engine and go for it. There we go, that's 80 meters per second and oh, we are so close. Fire this engine and we are away. And we've lost communications. We've lost communications. This is not good. We have no electric charge here. Um, I'm not going to be able to shut this thing down. Electric charge? Nope. What's going on here? Um, electric power? Rerouting power! Rerouting power! Oh! We got, We are live again! We are live! <laughs> oh! Oh wow, that was a... Uh, that we almost lost that satellite or it would have ended up in an improper orbit or something. Uh, that's great! Okay, now just got to make sure that we actually get this thing into orbit. Which, uh, yeah, just gives me time for another little history lesson. So, geostationary orbit, as you know, it's at the right altitude so that your orbit is 24 hours, and Arthur C. Clarke is actually frequently credited as inventing it. In fact, it's referred to as Clarke Orbit. However, it was apparently, there was another guy before Arthur C. Clarke, a guy, uh, Herman Nurdung or something, he was basically Austrian or something, I'm not really sure, I just know that he came from that part of the world. Anyway, uh, yeah, he came up with this book that he wrote this book basically about uh, living in space. That was his whole idea. He designed space stations with like elevator shafts and observatories and stuff. And he came up with this idea of putting satellites in these orbits. So uh, yeah, he came up with it first and he published it in this book. And then within a year of publishing the book, he died. And he died in poverty and nobody knew anything about it until years later when people realized he had the idea first. Although Arthur C. Clarke is still a pretty awesome ideas man. And we're reaching burnout. Okay, so we've burned out and here we're just going to make very tiny things. I'm just turning on and off very quickly because we do have to deal with signal delay at this altitude. So if I do little bursts, little bursts, come on. Oh, look at my fuel levels. They're getting really tiny. And I think that may have actually succeeded in the mission now. Our inclination is low enough. Um, our, let me just see. What have we got here? Uh, where is it? Contract come. Achieve geostationary orbit. Yes. Yes, we have, in fact, got our first communications satellite. And we barely did it. <laughs> the amount of fuel that we have left is minuscule. So I just used a tiny amount of fuel to start a small rotation in the satellite. The idea being that by forcing it to rotate, we will not end in any configuration where the solar panels are not getting power for extended periods. There we go. We also turned off the avionics here. The avionics take a little more power. They take like 50 watts versus 1 watt. When you turn off the avionics, you can't control the attitude. 
But that's fine, because we no longer need to fly this thing. We just get to watch it float around in space and act as a, you know, transmitter for future missions. This is actually perfect because it's over the Atlantic. We'll be able to maintain communications with any spacecraft as they traverse the Atlantic, having been launched from either the Cape or from French Guiana. So not only did we do this for the money, we've done it for the straight up peace of mind of not having to worry about losing communications from spacecraft as they depart our primary launch bases. We should build more of these things eventually, but that, that will be in future episodes. Until then, I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.